Hello, and welcome to another Profiles of Endurance. I'm Father Scott Vanderveer. When I was a new priest in town back in 2015, I was introduced to a local man named George, who had worked as a successful plumber in town for years, and who now was blind. George lost his eyesight on a single day when he was 53 years old, when a sudden and shocking illness and a high fever permanently damaged his optic nerve. His resilience is a source of wonder and strength for everyone in our community. So please listen now as this spiritual warrior shares with us how he stays positive and prevails over blindness and the other challenges he faces in his life. George, thank you so much for joining us today. We are thrilled to have you here for this conversation. And let's begin perhaps at, at the very beginning. Can you talk to us a little bit about your childhood? What was your, what was your family life like growing up? Where, where did you grow up? I was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1949. I was the fifth child of seven. My father and mother. My mother, unfortunately, was a ticking medical time bomb. She suffered from Huntington's disease. Huntington's is a rare neurological uh, disease where you lose your ability to speak, to think in series of what you're trying to do. You look like you're drunk or totally disoriented when you move. And uh, when I was born, I needed a complete transfusion right away. Uh, but at when my youngest sister Lillian was born, and she died almost right away, the social services, the Brooklyn child of protection came and took all of my siblings and I away when I was 18 months and 18 pounds because of the inability of my mother uh, with Huntington's. If you think, okay, I'm going to do laundry. I need the dirty clothes. I need the washing machine. I need the soap. Well, a Huntington's patient cannot formulate a series like that. Mm. Again, they get more than two thoughts, and it overwhelms them. They lose their ability to speak, their teeth, uh, whether it's male, female, uh, deteriorate. It and sounds, so, George, it sounds a little bit like a couple of things stand out to me. One is, I would think this is the kind of disease that might get misdiagnosed quite often. You know, it it, it might look to somebody like the person just isn't trying to, to live an organized life when it really is a serious neurological problem. It, it is. And the problem is that most Huntington's patients prior to the 1950s, it was, uh, it, it was, you, you went to a mental institution. My grandmother, because of her, uh, her entire family, uh, her siblings, all had Huntington's, and she wound up at Creedmoor uh, because you were just uh, the, the diagnosis back then was idiot, moron, and imbecile. Oh dear! And these diagnoses were common until uh, a little after World War Two. Uh, then it became mild, moderate, severe, and profound retardation. Mm. Do you remember your mom? Do you have memories of her? No. I have no memory uh, in 1961 when I was at Woolwood School for Boys. A counselor came and said, your mother died. And one of the kids said, oh, aren't you going to cry? But I couldn't understand his question because I never knew my mother 
I didn't know my father. And when I was returned to my father, I was 12, and there were people with the same name. But there's no emotional connection. Wow. You know, I just went through a series of foster homes and abuse, uh, physical, sexual, and, um, you know, but that's, uh, that's where I've been. George, so by the time you got to the school for boys, you had already been mistreated by foster families. Yes. Um, and I don't have any memory of them because they were quite violent and uh, you you uh, you just did what you were told and you know that's the way it was was it was it the state or the county or or a do-gooder who who helped you get into that school for boys after that well, rough time that's, that school was set up by the new york city episcopal mission for uh, the kids, boys from Brooklyn. We were, back then, uh, Brooklyn was uh, a terrible place. I, I, I mean, the rodents and, and critters, they didn't even bother to come because there was nothing for them to eat. Oh, and boy. You just, um, the mattresses were on the floor, your clothes were on the end, you, you just were surviving. So when you, when this Episcopal diocese set up this school, how did they determine who would qualify to go there? Um, the Brooklyn Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. Um, I didn't know I had other siblings. I was taken away. Uh, when Lillian died, I was 18 months and 18 pounds. The courts took all of the kids away and put us in different foster homes. My oldest sister and brother knew of us, but we did, I didn't know of them. And uh, it, we went through foster families, and then eventually um, Eleanor Roosevelt um, became one of the... Uh, founding members of the Wilton School for Boys, and that that's eventually where I and uh, 30 other kids wound up. What was life like in that school, George? It was very good. Um, there was no bars, no, uh, no corporal discipline, anything like that. Um, the housing area was very nice, very clean, and we had a castle where the, we had uh, former military horses, we had the military saddles, we had a, a man-made lake. Wow. Um, you wanted to run away, but you never knew why you wanted to run away. And I made the mistake of running away. I fell into the low side of a dam. I was drowning, but I was at peace. I was amazed at the bubbles. It was until, uh, you know, guidance counselor snatched me out of it. Um, but, you know, we had good food. We had uh, movies. Um, uh, you had, there was no fighting amongst the, the the colors. I mean, it didn't matter if you were white, black, Hispanic, you were just a kid. Yeah. Wow. So this, how, how, how long did you live in that environment? At, at what age did you leave that school? I, I left at 12. And, um, I, it, it has its stories that sometimes life brings you around. In 1960, one of our former alumni was Floyd Patterson. Ah. And Cus Amato was our gym teacher at the school. And Floyd Patterson went on to become the heavyweight champion of the world. Mm. 
And in 1960, at the Commodore Hotel, me and another boy representing Wiltwick were at the Commodore Hotel with Mayor Lindsay, Jackie Robertson, Casamato, and Floyd Patterson. Unforgettable. And, Unforgettable. And I was able, 50 years later, to tell um, a local man that his father had put the jewels on the heavyweight championship crown. <laughs> and he was he was unaware. He thought his father had put the jewels on a belt. But I gave him a picture of Floyd Patterson wearing the crown. Oh his father. wow! Wow! What a what an experience for a, a kid. You were eleven years old. Yes, and the, the the unusual thing was at the Commodore Hotel when they sat you down. Were you know the array of forks and knives and things that you know you were just blown away by you know you've never experienced anything like that where did you go when you were 12 and left the school uh, i went to uh, i was taken to pine bush new york in orange county and i was introduced to a man and they said this is your father and it was like meeting a total stranger. There was no, hi, son, welcome home. Um, it was just put your stuff down there. And that was it, you know. And uh, that September when I started school, I had only been from the fourth grade to the eighth grade. At Wilfred, we had school, but it was or less music lessons or riding horses or doing things of that nature. Mm. So uh, I met my friend uh, when I was 12, and uh, I moved in with his family when I was 14, and we've been friends for 60 years. Wow. My goodness. And so was that the age? Did you did you start attending middle school where, where your friend I, went? I, I did. I went to the to the eighth grade and it was time the uh, because we, we we weren't the brightest bulbs in the box and <laughs> you know um the teacher brought us into the uh, guidance counselor's room and we were both 16 and said uh, we think it's time you guys uh, packed your books and left so we we went out and went we worked on farms we worked at the uh, at plumbing shops and that's how we both got into uh, the plumbing field which became your your career i mean that's that was your bread and butter for most of your life is that right yes and i still do it totally blind i've had people believe in my skill i've installed water heaters sinks toilets um uh, i I love what I do, and I love helping other people. And with them having the faith and trust that I could put a circulator in or fix the boiler, um, you know, it it, it was a, a, a great emotional um, help in my when I, after I went blind. I have to tell you, George. I, those of us who know what a shortage there is of, of plumbers, you know, as a, as a pastor of two churches, we sometimes have plumbing trouble. And I know that, um, you know, getting on a plumber's calendar can be really challenging. And it's because it is of, it seems to me that of all of the building arts, you know, all the contracting work there is, plumbing is maybe right up there with electricity at the very top of something that you really need skill you, I mean, you can't, you can't just master that um, without an incredible combination of skill and experience. And to do it blind strikes me as just, just a miracle. So I know we might be getting ahead of things because you, you didn't always do this job blind. You worked for 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 many years as a as a plumber before you lost your sight. Take us back to working as a plumber 
and what it what it what occurred in your life that cost you your sight? How old were you when you were a plumber with sight? I started plumbing when I was twenty. After I got out of the service, I I started working for myself and other entities as a subcontractor, and I worked until two days before my fifty third birthday, and. I woke up, I was caring, back up a bit, I was caring for two brothers who were dying from Huntington's. One was in Middletown, New York, and one was in Lee, Mass. Did you have the and same I father, was, George? They, yep, we all had the same father, same mother. The Huntington's does not skip a generation. It skipped the first three of my siblings, it the brother before my and the brother after me. Wow. And uh, my father, who perished in a fire, there was nobody to take care of these two. Uh, my other siblings uh, didn't want to be involved. And as I guided them from the streets into uh, nursing homes and good care, I was putting 40 hours in a 24-hour can, and my immune system went south. Wow. And on the morning of April 14, 2002, I looked out the window, and that was the last thing I remember. I don't remember how people became aware of it, but later I found out that I was on my floor and they were working to save my life. But I, I wasn't blind, but I couldn't see. I couldn't feel them touching me. All I remember was hearing a local EMT saying, I'm not getting a pulse. And I know a local paramedic was now the mayor saying, I'm getting a faint one. And I was rushed to Albany Med. And uh, Gina had said that um, the doctors asked if I had any siblings. She said, yes. They said, you better get here because he's not going to make the end of the day. But my sister, Rosemary, stepped up quite nicely and said, don't worry, doctor. My brother's too dumb and stupid to die. Wow. Did, why did she say that? Because I, I've, I've hit freight trains broadside with a truck. I've rolled over a couple of vehicles. Um, I should have died when I was born because I was so anemic and in and out of the hospital. And, um, you know, we were on the verge of starvation. But I've always put one foot in front of the other. And um, I just, failure is not an option in life. You have survived all of those things. And, and it's, it's remarkable because it sounds to me, if, I, if I'm following the story well, your mother died young, your father died young, and a number of your siblings died. You, uh, you have how many siblings still living? I have three. Three are still living. And, so, and are any of, are the three that are alive spared of Huntington's or do any of them yes. have the disease? Uh, the, the first three sir, uh, did not get it. It went to number four and number six. And both of them died uh, young. Uh, one was uh, 50, the other one was 47. And the younger brother, uh, now I am in the process of um, trying to help out uh, his son um, because he will have Huntington's disease and he's on the cusp of the age where it hits you. Oh my. What what age is that, George? Um, usually around 45. Males will uh, go uh, generally to the mid-50s. Women generally go in their 40s. Um, but today, the technology, 
the uh, it, it it's not that we just lock you up in a in a psychiatric facility. Back when my mother and grandmother, that was the standard care. You were considered an idiot or a moron mm. or an imbecile, and it was based because the the age uh, the mental age is twelve or fifteen. Uh, on a grown adult. Wow. George, did you, if we pause the story right here, back in 2002 when you were first going through this health crisis, did you ever have the sense that your life was unusually hard, that you got a raw deal? Because it sounds like if you start to add all this stuff up, it's a lot of hard stuff all in one person's life. No, I am. I have never felt that life has dealt me a bad hand. Um, you know, I, I think that I've had a relatively easy life. Um, I think that my two brothers who died young, that uh, I had to have them arrested. I had to have them psychologically uh, evaluated. And when I'm doing that, I'm terrified Am I doing that because of their inability to care for themselves, or am I doing that just to get them taken care of? Mm. And uh, it wasn't until each one, I was there the day they died, and, you know, when I told them it was time to go, they were, they were, they were okay with it. Um, no, I, I think I've been very blessed in my life. Each of the things that I've incurred have made me, I think, uh, a better person. Yeah. Well, and it seems like the desire that you have to help others is a theme of each of these stages. You know, it was plumbing was a good field because you enjoyed getting people the kind of solutions that that helped them you took you took care of your brothers even even when it was a tough love thing you had to do you know but you you did what you had to do so it sounds like uh focusing on others has been a a source of of joy for you even when your own situation was not so easy yes i mean when i when i finally was discharged from opening bed and uh, several people said that we're having a party when I was taken to the quarry. And I mean, the place was just packed with people giving me well wishes, uh, people that I had worked for once, people that I had worked for many times, uh, the first generation of people that uh, now I was later working for their kids. Um, and it, it was uh, not a chance to, 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 to feel bad for yourself. It was, if all these people believe in you, then you've got to step up and not quit. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, and I, I got to say, I, uh, I gain a lot of strength from seeing people who have what looks like a, a situation in life that I couldn't handle on my own. When I see them handling it, it makes me not want to quit. And so, yeah, I, I, I hear that. And boy, those, those people, a lot of people in our community believe in you. And it's not just because they have faith. It's because they've seen what you can do, George. They've seen you continue your work even when everybody would assume that your your situation would prevent it. It's well, an amazing thing. One day, I say this, I was under, I, when I was discharged from Albany Bed, the nerve damage on my left side was excruciating. And, you know, you think to yourself, oh, the pain was just so unbearable, you wanted to die. And um, one day I, I made it into the bathroom, and there was water on the floor. Oh, no, this is at 1 o'clock in the morning. Oh. So I dropped to my knees, and it 
turned out the bolt in the toilet tank to the bowl had rusted away. I was darned if I was going to call uh, somebody to fix it. And I opened the back door and I thought to myself, okay, do you want to die? Go ahead, run and jump off. And I said to myself, I may be crazy, but I'm not stupid. Mm. And I went, I got the, the, the repair kit, I rebuilt the toilet, and it was God kicking me in the butt saying, pity party's over. Pity party was over. Man, oh man. So take us back to that to that time, George, April 14th, 2002. What illness did you have at that time? I had septus, I had a stroke, and the my body temperature when I was in ICU was so intense, it melted the oxygen line into the back of my neck, and it fried the optic nerves. Uh, they gave me massive doses of steroids to try to reverse it. But the steroids take you to places that your mind could never believe. But I, I, I just could not give up. Um, I had friends come to the hospital. Um, sometimes they stay and, and, you know, overnight sleep in the chair. Um, I just felt that, you know, this was a minor thing. Let's you know, let's push on. How remarkable to see something so hard is a minor thing. I, it's an amazing, amazing spirit that you have. So George, it was a high fever that, that fried your optic nerve, as you said, that is, yes. that is, so that means there are some people who are born blind and other people lose their sight because of a disease slowly over time, many people, one of the diseases that I hear as a priest quite often is macular degeneration, where you lose your sight over time. You didn't lose your sight over time. It became suddenly dark. Yes, it was an instant thing. Um, I remember, like I said, when I came out of my bedroom that day, I looked out the window. It was overcast, uh, and that was it. And when I uh, first came out of the coma, uh, after I don't know how long it was, um, the the first I don't know thirty seconds, split second, I could see the I had something in my hand, which turned out to be the intubation tube, and there were two nurses running towards me, and one had on a Barney smock, and it was a instant freeze frame picture and then that was it lights went out and never came back on your memory of this is it's you're telling it so well because these are just these innocuous things the intubation tube the barney smock but those are your last images in your brain of seeing yes wow george wow that's powerful I think all of our listeners are really understanding in a new way um, what what that what that experience was like for you, and that's really powerful. Uh, George, George, what what did you feel? Did you have a sense that your sight would come back? Was that some, was that a hope that you cl were clinging no, to? The the uh, instant. Uh, somebody had brought pictures in where I had just put a septic system in, was asking me where it lined up. And I said, well, somebody turn on the lights in here. And uh, the, the person said, well, I, you, well, the lights are on. I said, well, I can't see a damn thing. Pardon me. And the next thing you know, the nurse and the doctor, a female doctor and a male doctor come running in. They rushed me down to the ophthalmologist. He put that, you know, thing where they usually say, what can you see, A or B? And he just said, I'm hate, sorry to tell you, but you're never going to see again. Oh, George. And I was at peace with it because I had to get on the phone 
and I was moving my one brother from the hospital in Middletown over to the nursing home in Lee, Mass. So when I came out of the coma the second time and I was blind, I, I mainly was giving my phone. I got things to do. And they were rather, uh, they wouldn't let me out of Albany Med um, until I either volunteered for a 72 hour psychiatric hold or they were going to hold me for 72 hours because I didn't scream. I didn't barter with God. I just, I had to pull myself together. I had to move Robert from one uh, facility to another. And uh, I, how can I complain about being blind when these two are dying? And they had never, the, the, the professionals at Albany Med had never seen anyone before react the way that you did. They thought you were crazy for being calm. Yes, very much so. Wow, George. But you, this is 18 years ago. You are sticking yeah. almost 19 years ago. You are, um, this is how you feel. Yes. I mean, I can go down the street in, in just within Reed Street and find 10 people who have got it worse than I do. I can, I can still breathe. I can still, I, I, I've rebuilt the third floor of my building totally blind. George, take us through how a person learns to see without sight. It sounds like that's what you've done. You've been able to do. How did you start to gain the skills needed to live? You live independently to this day. Yes, I've lived independently from the uh, uh, right after I was eventually discharged from Albany Bed on July 18th of 2002. And um, it was just a matter of I needed something to keep my, my, my sanity. And so I would crawl up the stairs to the third floor and I had the, the 12 tribes come and frame the third floor. They would help me around the room and I would describe to them what I wanted, how I wanted the rooms designed. Um, I told my sister in 2002 exactly what I was going to do. And when she came back in November of 03, the first thing out of her mouth was spooky. And I said, why spooky? She said, well, it came out like you said. I said, they took my eyes, didn't take anything else. Wow. Wow. <laughs> you, so you were still the foreman of this job even though being blind was brand new for you. Yes. Amazing. Amazing. What kind of, what kind of services are available for people who are entering this world of being blind for the first time? The first place the state sent me was the Carroll Center, and that is the oldest blind center in the country, and that's in Boston. And things like uh, money. Um, when I went blind, I devised a situation, how I fold money, how I put it in my wallet. When I went to the blind center, the other fellow that uh, I went to classes with, he would just pull out a bunch of bills out of his pocket. He couldn't tell. Um, my mechanical skills helped me in being blind. Um, you know, I walked into a telephone pole, I've walked into a building, but you do that once or twice and the brain says, hmm, time to use the cane. Ah. And, and they, 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 they teach you how to negotiate sidewalks, they teach you how to, uh, you know, like when I shop for clothes, I get them all in a, a kind of a neutral color so I can mix and match and, you know, um, things like that. Amazing. Amazing. You, you have told me a little bit about how you use sound, um, to know how to go. And because you're able to use sound and, um, 
and humidity and air pressure, you sometimes even forget to bring your cane with you. Can you, can you talk to us about that? Yes. Uh, I live on the third floor of my building, and many times I have just thought, oh, I have to go to the post office. I, I put on my hat, walk down the stairs, walk over to the post office, and then somebody will say, where's your cane? Mm, it's upstairs on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you don't sink blind. You, you, you know, if, if you want to, the more you think of anything that you have, whether it be you're paralyzed or you're, uh, you, you, you lost a, a limb, anytime you, you, you have that front and foremost of what you don't have, I'm just grateful for what I do have. Mm. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm healthy. Uh, I recently had uh, a heart valve installed and a stent. Um, but I mean, it, it, it's minor. It's remarkable. It's remarkable. How did you know that you would be able to work again? You, 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 you told the story about the pity party ended the night that you found the, the water on the floor and felt for the, the bolts on the toilet. When did you start working again for others? It was about 2007. I was standing alongside my front of my building with my, my dog and a local resident who I knew approached me asking if I knew anybody who could fix it. She had a, a plumber put a new sink and faucet and everything leaked and she couldn't get them back. Oh. And I was looking if I could recommend somebody. And I said, well, if you don't mind, I'll go get my tools and I'll go take a look. And, you know, she sort of paused and said, you're, you're going to do what? And, uh, but she had faith in me. I took the sink, the faucet, the trap. I took everything apart, put it all back together, and it didn't leak. And then uh, other people who needed an oil tank gauge or a water heater or a faucet, uh, things like that, would start using me. Uh, and I... Recently, I went across Reed Street, put a circulator on a water heater. Um, that's how blind mice plumbing and heating got started. Blind mice plumbing and heating. That's the name of your business. Well, it's not a business. I do it. I, I do, you know, people come and get me and I go, I go put the parts in for them. Uh, one of the principal ones that um, I put a new bathroom in for and uh, all the fixtures uh, ripped out their boiler, uh, disconnected the coil on the hot water heater, was my blind rehab teacher. Oh, my goodness. Amazing. Amazing. I just, George, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. I'm, I'm so grateful to have that as an example in my life because I have just no idea what twists and turns are ahead of me on the road of life. And to, to know that even if I were to lose my sight, I wouldn't have to lose my dreams or my career. It's amazing. You, 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 you don't, you, you, you don't let the illness or the disability rule you. You, you get up every morning, just like I can see. I, 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 you know, I, uh, the yellow deli one day, they, had a problem and I came home, got my plunger. I walked in and people were in shock that I'm coming in with a cane in one hand, the plunger in the other, you know, but I don't feel blind. I don't, I just do what, what comes as natural to me as, as you doing a sermon at the church. Oh, uh, it's, it's, it's so, it's so exciting. You, you, you shared a lot of uh, your stories in a book that you wrote called Suddenly Dark. When did you know that you wanted to tell your story? Um, I knew in 2005 I had been writing short excerpts um, 
and I had written a book of poems, but they were extremely dark. Ah. Um, they were about the coach of death and and the difference, the battle between uh, death wanting me and me refusing it. Ah. And, um, and but it slowly I was able to work myself by writing. I had to learn how to use a computer. I'd never typed. Uh, I had to learn how to use a computer. I could use an iPhone. Um, it, it just you just do whatever it is you need to do. You 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 know. I I like I said. I feel I've been very blessed. I did the, the the things that have occurred in my life um, have been making me a better person. All along. The things that have occurred have been making you a better person all along. That is huge because I've got to say, one of the things I'm learning as a priest is that there is a real choice in that because a lot of folks, when bad things happen to them, they don't become a better person. They become a bitter person. And I don't know, did you ever have to make the choice to not be bitter? Were you ever tempted oh. to be bitter? Yes, I had to make that the day that they told me I was never going to see again. That day when they told me that, I could, they, 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 they wanted to know, they brought a psychiatrist in, a psychologist in, and I was telling them, look, you know, I, I need to learn how to walk. Um, the, the janitor brought a broom handle. And my sister would go to one end of the hall, and I would stumble and fall, and they would get very upset. And one of our local residents was kind enough to bring a for sale sign and put it over my bed. Uh. And it was it was funny. It was you know I I got an offer of twelve dollars and ninety five cents if the bed went with me. <laughs> it was, it, you, you needed humor. You found humor in the little things. But John and Robert were dying, and I was the only one out of my siblings that was going to take care of them. So there was no time for pity, no time. And and it serves no purpose. It, it shortens a person's life. It ruins. Um, I'm, I, I never thought that I would write anything. Um, I've won four bronze and one silver in the nationwide uh, creative writing for the VA. Uh, you know, it, it took uh, 12 years to write the autobiography, but it was just a matter of always putting one foot in front of the other. Amazing. Amazing. And George, you you have never let a setback stop you. And I know that there was one, you probably, you talked about walking into walls early on in a telephone pole once. Your, your most um, significant close call happened in on the third floor of your building. Can you tell us that story? Yes. On August 6th, uh, 2006, uh, I went into my office. My housekeeper had not put my chair back into the counter. I tripped over the chair and went sailing out the third floor window. Um, I, when I went down head first, I hit a steel pipe in the awning, bent it, and then I landed on the sidewalk. Uh, I shattered my femur in the left leg, my pelvic uh, bone, and my damage to the knee. Oh, and my I, goodness. Oh, my goodness. So you um, you fell right out. You, you fell onto this awning and then onto the floor below. Um, what did you think was happening? Did you know exactly what was happening as it was going on? What goes through your mind? Yes. Well, it did. Uh, 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 there was two people out on the sidewalk. They heard the thud, but I didn't scream because, it, you know, it was it wasn't anything I could do. So it was just a matter of riding it out, and 
but when I hit the awning, um, then I don't remember slamming into the sidewalk. But they came over, they thought maybe a bag of garbage or something had fallen. And there I was, splattered on the sidewalk. On, now, just out of curiosity, um, do you mind my asking what you were wearing? What time of day was it? I, uh, as you are often told by your mother, wear, make sure you're wearing clean, tidy whities So I had just taken a shower. I had on my tidy whities and that was it. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I oh my goodness. So for anybody on the street, all of a sudden a man from three floors up in his just his underwear came down quickly. Yes. My goodness, George. My goodness. Thank goodness you survived. How long was the recovery from that? Uh about a year. Um I had to you know, the first time I had to learn how to walk after uh, the stroke and, and the blindness in 2002. In 2006, the, the damage to the left leg, the pelvic area, the knee, uh, took me a good year to gain all of the feelings and control of those uh, pieces. My goodness. my George, you are a believer in God. I know you're not a member of my church, but but I'm curious. When you get to heaven and you get to meet God face to face, what are you going to say about this life that you've been living? I got to thank him for it. You know, uh, because the thing is, if you don't have adversities in life, you can't grow. Uh, and... Uh, you could look around if you want to feel sorry for yourself and have pity on yourself. You, you're going to go sit in the corner and nobody is going to help you. When I went blind and I tried doing things by myself, uh, uh, people would become uh, angry because I would do things that they would think, I don't know, will, will help you. And you, you just enjoy doing i mean when you quit if you quit you're all by yourself but if you try the neighborhood the city the village will make it happen you uh, you, you 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 but if you just roll up in a ball and hide in a corner you're going to be there all by yourself amazing yes yes and you it that has been true for you you People, you have done the best you could, and people have come to surround you with support. Yes. Amazing. Amazing, amazing. Wow. George, there's a, there's a couple questions I, I like to ask people who've been through stuff and endured, and I've never talked to anybody who's endured the things that you have, and I'm so grateful that you're willing to, to share it with me and with the people that'll listen. But I'm curious what you say to a question that I hear a lot as a priest and I've asked a lot as a person, and that is, does everything happen for a reason? Some people think that everything happens for a reason, that there's a great plan for, for, for our life and that everything that happens has a purpose. Other people would say, no, it's more random than that, but, but there is, there's a way to survive or to make lemonade out of any lemon that you get. What do you think about that question? How would you answer the question, does everything happen for a reason? I think everything happens for a reason. I should have died the day I was born. And doctors did extraordinary things. Uh, I, I survived. I have survived uh, hitting a, a, a freight train broadside. Um, I think everything is... It's, and it's like my, my mother with the Huntington's or, or my brothers. Um, it, it, my toughness is that, that um, failure to never quit. If I, uh, my other three walked away from the first two that were dying. Um, I think that we're here for a reason. And, you know, if, if, I, if the good Lord didn't have a reason... He should have taken me when I hit the train. He should have taken me when I was born. He should have taken me when I fell out the third floor window. 
So I think that everything here is part of, uh, I wouldn't say a plan, but it, 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 we have the option. Um, we have the option of quitting or we have the option of prevailing. And, and if you prevail, then the next thing in line, you know, it, it's, you know, that, I think that's my opinion is that all these things that have occurred have been part of a master plan. And, you know, I had the option any time to quit and give up, but I just can't do that. You just can't do that. Oh, I I can't help but say that after I'm listening to all that you're sharing right now and I, I face the next challenge, whatever that is, I am going to have more encouragement to not give up because the if 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 George Knauer is gonna face his challenges, who am I to to shy away from a challenge that that maybe is lesser than that? I, I think I feel very encouraged by that by that choice. You either you have the choice to quit or to persevere. And 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 I just or as you said it, prevailing. You prevail over it. I love that word. I need to prevail over this. I think that's so important. Wow. George, one final question, and that is the whole world right now is going through something that nobody who's alive really can can remember before this, and that is this this wild pandemic. And I'm wondering what your feelings are about how this could change us. From your point of view, from from your life and where you sit, what are your best hopes for what could what could emerge from us going through coronavirus? What do you think the future could hold? What are what are the opportunities that we're being given right now? Well, one of the opportunities that I think is we are all one step away from being in economic trouble when you're seeing millions of people having to go to food clinics or to seek, uh, they, they can't afford to go to the doctors. Um, it's seeing that the human spirit uh, may be beaten down, but it will not give up. Um, it will all prevail, yes, 300,000 have perished. Um, but I think it gives us a better appreciation, or it should, of what we do have. Um, I'm often asked if the glass is half empty or half full. And I tell people, I'm just glad I got the glass. <laughs> oh, I love it. Just to have the glass. Oh. George, I uh, I am so grateful for that. I'll tell you, I'd like to just lead our listeners in just a, a couple minutes of reflection before we go. And I'd like to ask all of you who are listening, if you would just maybe you'd like to close your eyes, if that is something that would help you to enter the the quiet of, of that darkness that George experiences. Um, maybe you can take just a, a few moments to, to deepen your breathing and savor something that you heard from this conversation. What was it that, that George said that spoke to your life? What did you think of when he said that you can't think blind? He can't think about his disability. He has to think about what he has. What does that invite you to do differently? When given the option of quitting or prevailing, how could how could you and I, the next time that's presented to us, choose what it takes to prevail over giving up? George's memoir, Suddenly Dark, tells the story of overcoming so many setbacks in life. What is it in your life that you're proudest of overcoming? And how could you share that with someone else to give them strength? George, I am leaving today with the word prevail. I, that's a, such an important word. It, it sums up your whole life. You have been 
challenged and tested and you have prevailed. And I am, I am hoping that I will be able to, uh, to grow in that, in that ability because of the example that you give me. George, thank you for spending time with us today. I'm so grateful. And thank you all for listening. God bless you.